Okay. We, we are about to go into Friendly Street Poet readings. Now, this should be a bit of fun. We've got a couple of performance poets um, who go by their stage names of uh, <laughs> Liliana Rose and, and Royce. Um, now, just to give you a, a background on Friendly Street uh, Poets, they're, um, they're actually Australia's longest running community open poetry reading venue, started in 1975 and um, uh, provided a platform for new emerging poets and a venue for more established writers to nurture their artistic growth. And now they've become interested and obsessed with science, which is great to see. Now, Liliana, could you please um, excite us with a performance? <laughs> Thank you. I must admit or confess that I tried to write some haiku or psycho, I should say, and I had a whole planet of science information coming this way and the rules of haiku coming from this way and they collided and I was left in a black hole. And so there was no psycho in that black hole, but there were apparently some other science poems, thank goodness. So um, let me start with some reminiscing from the days when I was a teacher. When I first started teaching, I had to teach agricultural science and that was fine because I did grow up on a farm. One of the projects involved fish. I hate fish, okay, but <laughs> that was okay because I did have a pet axolotl when I was little as well. Um, and what I remember from science and from um, teaching science in particular, that uh, despite all the careful planning with projects, things do not go as planned. So the next two poems are reflecting that. Fishes of kids. The task is simple, students to set up fish tanks and learn to care. First step to clean glass homes, gravel the beds, fake plants entertainment. Water fights a must. Fish bought in plastic bags from a shop, selected on price and colour, set free into a tank to swim in circles. Water is siphoned out often, fed frequently, kids determined to care. Soon, fish are floating, upside down, and the lesson ends. <laughs> I would just like to say that all of those fish were, were killed in the name of love. <laughs> there was a lot of love in that room. <laughs> okay, the next uh, projects that we worked on was school garden plots. They were a little bit more successful, not so much at the same school because it was ag science. We did have sheep and someone would always leave the gate open and the sheep would always come in and eat the veggies. But at a different school, it was nicely enclosed. So we didn't have sheep as a competition and it was a bit more successful. School garden plot. Looks infertile except for weeds. Spades massage dirt. 24 pairs of hands want to get dirty. Seeds pushed into darkness, many too close, flooded with water, choked with straw, left to chance, no chemicals here. Check twice a week, impatient eyes try to discern between weeds and veggies. Like magic, new shoots grow, burst with pods, bulge with tubers, ignoring holes in beans, brushing off the dirt, Raw crunching occupies mouths. Stomachs are full. Excitement grows. 24 want to try again. <laughs> and I would just like to say that the worms were eaten too. No problem. Before I was a teacher, I was in um, developmental molecular biology. So that meant I had to write a poem about deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, but I have used the word DNA. Two snakes unwind, ready to replicate nature's perfect code, balanced in secret, a mosaic of sugar, phosphate and bases, held in bondage, unzipped and exposed, a pairing game begins, A's hold with T's, G's lock with C's, forming a ladder for enzymes to climb, organising chemical strands around proteins, Winding and winding, tighter and tighter, one cell becomes two. Chromosomes sit in the brain of the cell, holding universal knowledge, waiting to repeat the cycle, 
in their microscopic world unbeknown to the owner. Quite unexpectedly, I'm in cahoots with Keats. Earlier this year, so OMG, I'm a poet who's written a poem about a rainbow, <laughs> which is the poem I'm going to finish on today. So earlier this year, I spent some time volunteering in Peru, and the village that I worked in was called Chinchero, which means the birthplace of rainbows, and at 4,000 metres above sea level with rain every day, rainbows were on my mind often. And they reminded me of a childhood memory, and I've combined that memory with the background that I have in science. Nature's experiment. Rain mixed with a bit of cloud, plenty of white light, temperature best cold. An experiment in the sky is set by mother. High in altitude, natural falling prisms fall to a thirsty earth. Light refracts, breaking the invisible. Roy G. Biv schooled in my head. Red has the longest wavelength, disperses most at sunset and sunrise. Orange has a wavelength of about 600 nanometers. Yellow is not a primary color. Green is a primary color. Blue wavelengths are shorter. Indigo travels slower. Violet is hardest to see. Seven colors ordered and blended, scattered show a welcoming arc. Known components revealed, no promise here. Still I wonder, where is the gold? Well done, and now the aforementioned Royce. Can you hear me? It works well? Yes? All right, good. Yeah. She kisses like a shotgun blast through Hemingway's skull. A record skips, a record skips, a record skips, and suddenly, swans are reflecting elephants. Geckos crawl up the insides of my eyelids. Spiders hang their webs in the spaces between my fingers. Beetles burrow beneath the surface of my skin. Snails are being accelerated without limit, allowing effects to be witnessed before cause, allowing time to be traversed, allowing those snails to go back through the ages, meet the ancients, collect unks and dinosaur bones. Meditations have opened third, fourth, and fifth eyes. They blink as one. Too many poems have created a shortage of words, forcing Parliament to pass legislation declaring henceforth that all literary works shall begin with their humble conclusions and conclude with their proud beginnings. Beaten, battered, and bored, instruments have risen up thrown off their masters and taken to playing in the streets. Scientists and holy men have armed hands with bats, bottles, knives, overturned tables, smashed chairs, and are brawling to test the inner workings of karma. Nigerian ministers of finance have taken up residence in Buckingham Palace after Lizzie signed over the British Empire as collateral for a bad investment. Jesus has come back Iraqi and now looks set to nail himself to a question mark while Romans sacrifice themselves like Aztecs to Australian idols. <laughs> Rainbows curl from buildings like legless ponies, stampede through city laneways, and Rick from accounting squeezes himself into a lift cramp full of rhinoceroses. People fall up flights of stairs, while flocks of airplanes travel south for the winter to enjoy cocktails on Brazilian beaches. Armless boys stare vacantly from park swings, which remain stationary at positions perfectly horizontal to the ground. Wordsmiths hammer and forge mathematical formulae. Heart set on calculating pi to infinity before substituting numbers for letters, so that th thereby allowing the circles to write this very poem. And suddenly, I come to realize that everything between me and her, all of it, is just a beautiful, perfect nonsense. Thank you. <laughs> And normally I don't introduce poems, but I think it's only fitting that before I bring in my next one, I mention that my favorite poet, Saul Williams, has this line when he performs and he says, we stand as the manifest equivalent of three, back, three buckets of water and a handful of minerals, thereby realizing that those same buckets when turned upside down provide the percussive factor of forever. I think that's very potent and a very like interesting symbol. Anyway. Diaspora. That word should resonate from within all of us. We are stardust, handfuls of elements and atoms. Each of us has been in existence since before time. Our flesh once forged in the belly of a bleeding sun and then scattered, thrown across galaxies to be collected up again, millions of years later, to be reformed over, with, and by time into planets, plants, animals, and persons. 
And at the core of every person, there is a heat, a beat, a passion that consumes experience like fusion, emits thought like flares, mixes and blends reality and perception, stellar nucleosynthesis like twin turntables that mix and blend, dips in tarantella beats with electricity, pump it out through speakers, ordering audiences to dance, radiate, generate light. To illuminate entire worlds in abandoned behaviors that construct race, class, gender, sexuality, recognizing them as black holes that steal the light of every person and reflects nothing. Inside every person, there is a universe. Crack open any skull to watch the planets and solar systems within rotate like the whirling gears and mechanical clocks. Rotate as each person thinks and tracks time. Tracks time as they orbit their origin and plant memory upon membrane. Remember, death may be inevitable, but so is reincarnation. Entire lifetimes are imprinted like the grooves in a vinyl record within memory, within the person, upon our stardust shell catings. And that memory imprinted stardust is shared with every living being planet and nebula, replanted, reconstituted, returned. And remember, like King, Lenon, and the third Imam, that supernova, the death throes of suns can outshine entire fucking galaxies. Our ancestors were right to worship the sun because that's where we came from before time when we escaped Eden as bare elements, riding beams of light, riding shotgun and shockwaves to the farthest reaches of space. We belong to the first diaspora. We are all one. Thank you. And before I go, I'm kind of, I've got a plug for you. Um, Rebel Slam, which is the slam operated by Friendly Street, it's, it's, it's coming back on the Monday the 6th of next month. And if you want to find out more details, go to friendlystreetpoets.org.au. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Royce. You took us through the looking glass, and I'm not sure we're going to find our way back. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thanks. Uh, Ace. By the way, um, Friendly Street held a meeting at, this, at the exchange here in July uh, where poets were invited to share and experience science-inspired poems. A podcast of that evening can be found on the RIOS website, which is riaus.org.au. Okay, now, snatching through black, back into the, uh, into the uh, looking glass, out of the looking glass, into the real world, we are going, well, we are coming back into the real world, but uh, we're going to take a diversion, a tangent, because we're about to hear uh, some readings from Sean Williams. Now, those of you who don't know, Sean Williams is a science fiction writer of global repute. Uh, he's been on the New York Times bestseller list, don't we all wish we were there? And he lives in Adelaide. Uh, he's the author of over 60 published short stories and 22 novels, including Books of the Cataclysm, uh, The Resurrected Man, and the Multiple recipient of both the Dittmar and Aurelius Awards, which are the highest honours in Australian science fiction. As well as his original work, he has written several novels in the Star Wars universe. And for a change of pace, he likes to DJ and uh, cook a curry. So let's get him to cook up a, a, a science fiction curry for us here, Sean Williams. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think I've made a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, I am best known as a novelist. Uh, in fact, my 30th novel was published last week, two weeks ago. Um, but I thought, seeing as it's all about uh, science and uh, poetry, maybe I'd uh, uh, talk to you about my poetry reading. Um, I s because I've always wanted to write a novel uh, and, and be a novelist and have been writing novels for a very long time now, uh, there's not much room to do anything else. Uh, and for a while there, I was writing four books a year. And in that period, I, I, I discovered that I liked writing haiku. Now, haiku really appealed to me because it was short. Uh, and when you're trying to write 1,500 words a day on a novel every day for three years, uh, short really appealed. So the Sydney Writers' Festival held their inaugural haiku competition in, I think it was 2000 or 2001. And I decided that I was going to win something in that contest. So I sent them a haiku every day. Well, to make it harder, uh, to make it harder, it had to have the word eternity in it. So there were four eternity, four syllables gone from the usual 17. So, so I wrote a haiku every day. Uh, and I was living with a, a wonderful local writer called Kirsty Brooks um, at the time. So she thought it was hilarious that I was even trying. She thought it was even more hilarious after 10 days that my emails started bouncing back. 
And my, my haiku, my eternity haikus were so bad that they were being rejected by the internet even. So, so I, I'd written another 10 or so, so I just part, sent them, I printed them out and said, look, you're going to hate these anyway, but here they are, and that's it, I'll stop now. So in about, about two or three weeks after the, uh, the Sydney Writers' Festival finished, I got a um, phone call from the organisers saying, um, where would you like your prize sent? And I said, what, what do you mean? And, and she said, well, you, you're one of the three winners of the haiku competition. I went, really? Fantastic, thinking immediately of revenge on Kirsty uh, and everybody else who had mocked me. And it turns out that one of my haikus had been printed on giant banners all over Sydney. Uh, and so I got one of those. But the real prize uh, was the pair of Y fronts uh, with my haikus <laughs> stitched on it. Uh, uh, now, that haiku was uh, not particularly good, but I'll read it for you now. Uh, et eternity... Uh, all my haikus for this contest started Eternity Is, but this one finished Eternity Is the Fading Smell of Cologne in an Empty Room. <laughs> so I have a pair of underpants with that printed on it. <laughs> and uh, Kirsty's never lived it down, of course. Uh, so I moved from there thinking, well, I've obviously got a real talent for this. You know? <laughs> the internet may have rejected me, but uh, uh, I've got some underpants to prove that I can write a haiku. So uh, I was invited to um, contribute to an anthology called Daikaiju, and if there are any Godzilla or Gamera fans here or Japanese giant monster movies, uh, you would know that Daikaiju is the word for uh, giant monster or um, it probably literally means something else, but um, it's usually the term. So I thought, well, uh, from the very large to the very small, I don't have time to write a short story. Maybe they'd like some Daikaiju haiku. Uh, so I started writing um, uh, poetry along that vein uh, and had several pieces published. Uh, some under the name Dai Haiku, uh, some under the name Haikaiju, uh, <laughs> which again probably means something really rude in Japanese. So I thought I'd read you some of those. So these are kind of, instead of Saiku, these are sci fi ku, uh, something completely different. So uh, if you don't know, uh, Godzilla is also known as Gojira, and it must be said Gojira in that kind of tone. So, um, number one, uh, daybreak in Tokyo, people screaming, earth shaking. Scaly head rises. Uh, and number two, take under clawed foot, grim comfort from the knowledge nature bounces back. Uh, and the third one, um, where are the dragons? Nature abhors a vacuum, Gojira provides. <laughs> Uh, so I moved from a uh, slightly silly sci-fi haiku to uh, wanting to write serious haiku, and I was never particularly good at it. Uh, I'm not a very good poet. Uh, you know, following the wonderful poetry that you've heard tonight, I've been sitting there sweating and cringing in my corner, thinking, is it too late to, you know, feign a gastric kind of spell? Or, uh, uh, But uh, I, um, being a Star Wars writer and an occasional collaborator with people like Garth Nix and, and others, um, I've become really interested in the whole remixing phenomenon that's uh, uh, been happening um, you know, everywhere uh, lately, also partly through being interested in DJing, where you take another writer's work and you manipulate it, twist it, sample it, um, re remake it in a new way. Um, I worked on a, uh, a, a short story by another writer called Kim Wilkins, uh, turned that into a, a villanelle. Uh, that was my first experiment. I really enjoyed it. And uh, again, I was uh, invited to be in an anthology, an anthology selling, ce celebrating one of the many Charles Darwin um, anniversaries that have been around in the last 12 months. And this was an anthology called The Tangled Bank, Love, Wonder and Evolution, uh, edited by a fellow called Chris Lynch. And he was looking for uh, short stories and poetry. And uh, my first thought was, this, this would be fantastic to be involved in. Um, don't have time. Uh, my second thought was, well, how about a haiku or two? You know, it's worked in the past. Um, uh, and then I thought, well, why not try and, seeing as I don't feel confident being a poet, feeling like my word choices aren't particularly uh, the best sometimes, why not try a different sort of collaboration uh, with somebody who's dead? Uh, why not try to collaborate with Charles Darwin? You know, seeing it was, it was a book celebrating the anthology of Origin of the Species, why not try and do something with Charles Darwin's words? Uh, so that's where I kind of started with this particular work um, that I'm going to read to you now. It's called... Uh, the origin of haiku by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured renga in the struggle, struggle for meaning. Uh, and my intention was to capture each of, each of the chapters of The Origin of Species in as small a space as possible using Charles Darwin's own words. I also tried, just to make things interesting, I also tried to capture the evolution of the haiku form from the earliest known uh, forms to some recent experimentations like um, saiku. 
So each of the, the small poems that I'm about to read to you uh, feature phrases plucked from the relevant chapters and rearranged at will. And there's sort of a resonance there with the idea that genes suffle, shuffle with each sexual um, reproduction, uh, but only in this instance would I claim the existence of an intelligent designer. Uh, so, for instance, um, the sentence uh, from chapter two, um, before applying the principles arrived at in the last chapter to, to organic beings in a state of nature, we must briefly discuss whether these latter are subject to any variation. I particularly like the words organic beings in a state of nature, so I would pluck those little phrases out and try and find ways to connect them into, into the chapter by chapter. So, um, I'll run through. This is probably the fastest uh, iteration of... Um, um, the origin of the species uh, you'll ever sit through. So, uh, the introduction, uh, which I did in sort of the modern convention of haiku form with the 17 syllables, 575, to sort of start things off. Although much remains and will long remain obscure, entertain no doubt, with Charles Darwin's exclamation mark contained. Chapter one, variation under domestication. I chose to do a Renga form, um, orchid and flower, the predominant no. orchid and flower, the predominant power most useful to man, changes such slow, varying, and insensible changes. Chapter two, uh, variation under nature. I chose the Renku form for that. Um, organic beings in a state of nature weave the most flourishing life throughout the universe. Long catalogue of dry facts because the Renku is supposed to be kind of a, a ironic commentation, commentary on whatever you're talking about. Um, struggle for existence, chapter three, a highborn, which starts off with a piece of prose usually, and then has a, a small little piece of um, haiku commenting on the prose. Uh, we behold the face of nature bright with gladness. We see these beautiful co-adaptations, all those these exquisite adaptations of one part of the organization to another part, and to the conditions of life, and of one distinct organic being to another being, perfected in the economy of nature. Throw up a handful of feathers and all must fall to the ground according to definite laws. Vigorous, healthy, happy, birds and beasts of prey, death is generally prompt. Uh, for chapter four, I chose the Heiger, which is normally incorporates a piece of art as an integral, par integral pass part of the, 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 the haiku. Uh, and there was only one piece of art, one piece of um, visual media in the entire of Darwin's original book, which was this, the, the Tree of Life kind of image. So I decided to do something uh, around that. Um, so it kind of looks like that. I didn't draw that because I can't draw. And the haiku is sort of sprinkled amongst the branches like, like fruit or leaves. Uh, the amount of change in the great battle for life, how strange are these facts? Chapter five, Laws of Variation was for a, a Japanese poet called Shiki. In shell, uh, yeah, laws of variation. Um, in shallow water, on islands or near the coast, a stripe of colour. Chapter six uh, was a senryu um, on the subject of difficulties on theory. Unity of type by unity of descent, the races of man. Hopefully very profound, but nowhere near as profound as Darwin would have wanted it to be, I'm sure. Chapter 7, Instinct uh, for Yasuda. In the nests of bees, as the young cuckoo, a dog, mental quality. Chapter 8, on hybridism for, for Henderson. We're moving forward in time. Count the seeds of the male ass to perfect fertility. An allied yet very different class, vari varieties gallinaceous. Chapter nine was on the imperfection of the geological record, uh, and I chose uh, Virgilio to, for the style. Preserve to a distant age a little reflection. Chapter 10, on the geological succession of organic beings, I chose um, spice or spice. Very slowly, one after the other, supplanted, imperfect. Chapter 11, Geographical Distribution. We're really heading into the 20th century now. I chose a monoku, which like the saiku, is a variation, a modern variation on the haiku form. And it's, a, it's designed to be a single line, hence mono. Um, and I chose to have a space between 
the two clauses to symbolise what the poem was about. So on the left-hand side, you have the living waters, and on the right, you have a striking passage, thereby demonstrating geographical distribution. Chapter 12, uh, Geographical Distribution Continued, uh, is a haiku, haiku, it's a four-lined haiku. Anything goes in the 20th century. Uh, separated by barriers of land, long succession of ages related in blood. Chapter 13, on the mutual affinities of organic beings, morphology, embryology, rudimentary organs, uh, I chose a circu, which is a haiku that's in, still in three lines, but designed to be in a circle, so it can be read forever. So, uh, so my circu looks like that. Elliptic courses around the sun, an arrangement complex, radiating and circuitous. Chapter 14, last chapter you'll be pleased to know, uh, recapitulation and conclusion. Uh, back to haiku form. One long argument from the war of nature from an entangled bank. And that is the entire Charles Darwin book in five minutes. I'll end with... Because that's a bit dry, a bit, a bit like a science lecture in haiku form, I thought I'd end with one more daikaiju, uh, um, haikaiju poem, um, which, a slightly longer one, which goes like this. I am daikaiju, nature's larger-than-life friend, the hills know my name. I am daikaiju, friend of children, foe of man, I come when I'm called. I am daikaiju, red in eye, teeth, claw, and tail, I am Daikaiju, hear me roar. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you heard it, ladies and gentlemen, the complete works, or the complete origin of species slightly abridged by Sean Williams in haiku, various haiku poems. I'm, I'm stunned, I'm stunned. Sean, you obviously will do everything you can to avoid turning in a manuscript. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Um, if, in the interest of brevity, in the interest of, you know, that you're obsessed with brevity, may I appoint you to um, the science fiction section of Cosmos, which runs between 2,000 and 4,000 words. It's, you know, relatively brief, and uh, you're welcome to, um, to write for it. it would be, we'd, we'd welcome you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please thank the Gozira of science fiction in Australia. <laughs> and that, I'm sorry to say is the end of today's fabulous event. Uh, remember to check out... I'm sorry, somebody say something? Oh, you were crying, were you? Don't cry, don't cry, Marin, don't cry. Uh, we have the tower room, remember? Um, and we also have the basement, and we promise we won't lock you in there. You have... Uh, the w in the basement, they're going to be doing the swaps of the books. Uh, you have... A sorry, the tower rooms, where we're doing the swaps, swaps of the books. My apologies. You've got uh, these books, which you, you're welcome to take for friends and colleagues. If not, or if you haven't already got one, don't forget the um, the stickers and uh, copies of Cosmos, which you're welcome to pass on to your friends and colleagues. And of course, you're all going to subscribe, I know. Um, and uh, thank you so very much for uh, the organisers of this, the fabulous Lisa Bailey. Come on up. Let's thank her. Where is she? The tattooed Lisa Bailey, no less. <laughs> and uh, and Amanda from RI, who has been the. Op the has been here and pulled it all together. And um, who else do I need to thank? Um, who else is back there? I can't quite tell. Peter is back there. Peter, thank you so very much. He was hiding. He had his head down so I wouldn't see him. He was hiding. And thank you for coming on this last day of our Festival of Democracy. Remember, vote early and vote often. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>